I'm Pastor Josh. And I'm Pastor Tara. We want to welcome you to our YouTube page and we pray that today you're blessed by everything you experience. And if you are blessed by this sermon, please don't forget to share it with someone in your world. Let's go live to the message. I want to speak to you about the subject overcoming worry. Can you say overcoming worry? All right. Do you have a worry today? Raise your hand if you have a worry. Raise two hands if you're like me and a foot. <laughs> right, right. We have a lot to be worried about naturally. We have a lot to talk about when we think about our natural circumstances. If you're not worried, you're not alive. You're not breathing. And the amazing thing is the Bible deals with worry. The Bible does not want you overcome with worry. The Bible wants you to overcome worry, right? You might have come into this place today, overcome with worry, right? And right now you're already fighting with me because you're consumed with your challenges and your issues and your circumstances and you don't want a sermon about overcoming worry, right? You, you wanna hear about something else. But the truth is God wants you to walk free from worry so that you can truly live by faith, amen. amen. So we're gonna go to the scripture today to help you overcome worry with the word of God. Philippians chapter four, verses four. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So when does the Bible want us to be rejoicing? And what does it repeat again? Rejoice, right? Why? Because it needs to say it twice because your first response to always is but. Right, this is not an environment to be rejoicing in. This is not a circumstance to be rejoicing in. Why? Because we rejoice when circumstances change, right? I mean, when we win the Rugby World Cup, we rejoiced, right? And there was another country all around the world on the other side of town, right? Screaming in pain. They were not rejoicing. They were complaining because they lost, right? And we were going, sorry for you, but we're rejoicing because we won. And they weren't rejoicing, why? Because they lost. So the world recognizes rejoicing, but the world's rejoicing is circumstantial. It rejoices when it gets its desired result. After the fact, when circumstances change. But the Bible doesn't say, look at your circumstances. The Bible says, always, right? And again, I say, rejoice. Let's keep reading so everybody can get more angry with the author. I didn't write this, by the way. Okay, so don't get cross with me. It then says, what? Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Say, be anxious for nothing. Now I want you to say, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. So I want you to say, anxious for nothing, everything in prayer, I'm thankful. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, okay? So let's go back to see where do we get to put a but into this statement, right? Be anxious for nothing, but great. We have a but. Be anxious for nothing, but when things don't go your way. Doesn't say that. I mean, if, if I had said to you, be anxious for nothing, but what would the human mind say? But when it's not your fault, you can be anxious. When it's unfair, you can be anxious, right? When things aren't going your way, but you're trying hard, you can be anxious. No, but the Bible says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And when this happens, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Now, what understanding does this peace surpass? All human understanding. It's not, it doesn't surpass God's understanding, but how do many of you know God, His mind is higher than your mind? His mental capacity is higher than your capacity. 
God's understanding, right, has peace because we never see God stressed. When Jesus walked the earth, he never stressed. He never worried. In fact, the only time he came under duress was when he took your place before the cross. He starts sweating blood when he receives all that you deserved. So when he exchanged with you, he took your stress. And that stress was so great because of all the sin in the earth, past, present, and future, the first thing he does is he starts sweating blood, which is actually possible if you come under the greatest stress possible. Sometimes if people are tortured, they can sweat blood because your capillaries in your head burst. But it's one of the greatest, it, it's, one, it's literally the sign of greatest stress. So God isn't stressed because God is God and because he's righteous without sin, right? Sin enters the picture, right? And with sin comes stress. When Adam and Eve sinned, what was the first, one of the first curses pronounced on them? By the sweat of your brow will you eat. When you toil in the sun and you sweat and you plow and you work, only then can you eat. That wasn't a blessing. That's a curse that came through sin. So God doesn't live under a curse, right? God, God is not under the curse. So when we see God, his understanding of all situations does not come from a stressful place. But your understanding does. Your understanding of your situation is based on the information you have and what you know. And the more you focus on what you have and what you know, the more you should stress. Because your natural understanding would say, I will be overcome by my circumstance. I will be overcome by my enemy. I will be overcome by this disease. I will be overcome by this situation, right? That's where you see things at, but God is never overcome. He's God, right? So the thing is, this understanding that surpasses human understanding is where God is now. He never ever moves from peace to stress. But you can move from stress to peace, right? But is it amazing that your body, your life and your circumstance, immediately, the moment you evaluate things, naturally, you should start stressing because you come down to where you're at on the earth, facing your enemies in your own strength, facing your situation in your own strength. But God wants you to rise up, up to his peace, where his mind is. The renewing of the mind is shifting from how you see your life, your circumstance, to how the word sees your life and your circumstance. Do you wanna know how to live more stressed and more oppressed and more down? Live based on your truth. Because your truth is a fallen truth. It's not the truth. I say this to people, that might be a truth, but it doesn't mean it's the truth. A truth today is the world is without financial stability. A truth today is that you should fear the future. A truth today is that there are certain diseases that no medicine can cure. A truth today says that you should fear for your future, but that is not the truth. So when a truth comes and says, but Jesus, you don't understand, Lazarus has been dead four days, the truth says, that's not, I'm not submitted to a truth. I am the truth, right? But as long as you live by your truth, as long as you live by your truth, you are limited to your ability. Amen? So God speaks very clearly to us here. And then he literally says, he wants you to live in a peace that surpasses human understanding that will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. He then goes on to say, in verse eight, finally, beloved brethren, this is to the church, whatever things are true, 
whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What things? The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, do them. And God and his peace will be with you. Can I ask you a question from the news? Do you get things that tell you noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praiseworthy? Do you get told the things in the news that Paul teaches, preaches, and writes, and does? Do you get that from social media? <laughs> Do you get that from your friends that haven't read the Word or couldn't care about the Word? No. The point is, what Paul is saying is, focus on the Word of God and His character, right? And live in faith about the goodness of God, right? And the peace of God is attached to that. So worry is attached to all other knowledge. All other realities come with worry. I know people today that have nothing and they're stressed. People that are on the streets with nothing. People right here, right now, you might be listening to the sermon today and you've lost everything or you're thinking you're going to lose everything or you're about to lose everything. You're worrying. Can I tell you another thing? I know billionaires and they're just as worried. Do you wanna know something interesting? If you look at the use of antidepressants and medications that help you chemically fight against stress and panic, do you know that those medications go up in use the more money people have? Do you know suicide goes up in circumstances where people have more, statistically speaking, right? Because the bottom line is, the more you know, the more you stress. It's fascinating to me that actually Adam and Eve's whole fall was based on them knowing what God knew. Rather than believing what God said. The devil comes and says, did he not say, and he twists the words of God to unbelief. But if you know all the things for yourself, then you'll know what truth is. The problem is you're not supposed to know everything yourself. You're not designed to know those things. You are designed to know him and his goodness and his grace, right? If you go to my children right now, you know, Tara and I are really excited, church, because for the first time in years, we are preparing to take a family holiday, an extended family holiday, right? Um, we haven't had one in a long time. And I know that you as a church are gonna be so taken care of and we have an incredible team and there's incredible ministers coming in. But the point is we're so excited to go, but my children have no idea all the planning and preparation involved in traveling, all the stresses that come with traveling. It's like everything got more complicated after 2020. It used to just be this is how you travel. Now it's not just this is how you travel. And everything, you don't just get a seat, you gotta reserve a seat, you gotta move a seat, you gotta tell them what the bag looks like and what the bag weighs, and that's just getting on a plane, and then you gotta know that all your paperwork's in order and everything else is in order. It's like 50 pages of information just to travel, right? Forget the fact that we'll get in a car that we rent and drive on another side of the road. Can you imagine me sitting my children down, kids? Dad's about to drive on the other side of the road. No, they're just gonna be looking at the car going, this is amazing, right? We're traveling in a car, we're going somewhere fun, we're learning something new. I could be telling our kids, sitting them down and saying, are you aware there is a global risk of violence? Where we're going, there's possibilities. Like, do you get what I'm trying to say? They don't need to know that information. It's my responsibility to take them there and to just let them have a great time. Do you not understand what this costs if you calculate the price of a Coca-Cola here and you convert it to rands? Dad's gonna be broke. Mom and dad, we're gonna be on the streets. We're gonna have to wash the dishes at the restaurant. They don't have to think about who's paying for things, right? So the thing is, we are designed, we are designed to be God's children, looking to Him for protection, provision, and leading. Right, we're not designed to be the one responsible for provision and protection and leading, right? But the moment you put yourself in that place, 
You're going to rob yourself of his peace. Don't take his place at the cross. Don't take his place, right, in I am undeserving, I'm not righteous, I haven't done enough, earned enough, worked enough. No, he took that place so that you could take his place, the place of peace and supply and provision and protection. And you might say to me, well, pastor, that's fantastic. The writer of Philippians is telling us to relax. He doesn't know what I'm going through. The apostle Paul, funny, you should say that, Paul. Do the things that I do. Meditate on the things that I meditate on. You're writing to the Philippians, Paul, I'm sure it's fantastic for you, but you don't have my circumstance. You don't have my situation. You don't face my diagnosis. You don't face my lack. You don't face what I face. But can I tell you where Paul is writing this from? Oh, he's not writing it from a beach. It sounds like from a beach. You know, we go to the beach and we say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It's like a passage of scripture that feels as though it's written from this place of Zen and meditation, right? Yeah, you, you read this and I, I'm not saying this, I, I don't believe in sitting, I can't sit with my legs folded like that. I don't have the elasticity. And all of you who love Pilates and yoga, I'm not interested in putting my body through such suffering. Bless you. Okay, but I can't even sit like this, okay? But you might picture if I read you this passage, you know, don't worry, don't be anxious in everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, everything that's true, noble and just, pure and lovely, but you don't have my circumstance. He is writing this from a prison cell. Not only is he in a prison cell, he believes his time of death is near. He is facing certain death, right? He is writing to the church that's based in Philippi, the Philippian church. And one of the problems with the Philippian church is they had become comfortable because the Philippian church didn't face the same persecution as the church in Rome. They actually had protection. They actually had the ability to gather. They had the ability to pay for things. They were not under the level of persecution that the church in other parts of Rome at the time faced. Yet, they had the biggest problems. Isn't that interesting? The more you have, the more problems you have, right? And what you have, you look at as nothing until you see someone else, uh, when you see someone else has more. I love my car until you see someone else's car. I love my house until I see someone else's house. I love my salary until I learn of someone else's. Hey, right? It's like I'm happy until, right? And the interesting thing is he's writing to them, but he doesn't say to them, do these things that I don't do. He says, this is what I'm doing. And this is the peace I have. In fact, Paul possesses such peace that he is not only thrown in jail, right? Early church historians tell us that often Paul is not only in prison, but he is shackled to a guard. He, now, can I tell you something? <laughs> I've seen some funny movies where people are, are, are uh, by mistake, handcuffed to each other, right? And you know what happens when you're handcuffed to someone? You get severely annoyed with them, don't you? Right, I don't know about you, but you'll have a best friend that you go on holiday with until about five or six days into the vacation. I never forget growing up, when I was an only child until I was 10 years of age, I always wanted a friend to come on holiday with us. And they were my best friend. And we were best friends until about a week into the holiday. And then you start to drive each other crazy, right? Because being with someone all the time makes you aware of their flaws. Now, Paul is chained to a prison guard. And not only was he chained to a prison guard, how many of you know he's the prisoner and the guard is the guard? There's no fair chaining here. 
So you could imagine the prison guard being always tempted to just hit him, just smack him, shut up, stop praying, stop talking, beat him, right? But the prison had a problem with Paul. Because every time a guard was chained to Paul, that guard would often come to faith in Jesus. Hold on, I wanna take you somewhere. I wanna put you in a picture. A believer functioning from the peace of God in the middle of a prison as a prisoner has such a level of peace and wholeness and grace and favor that the very God given to reign over them submits to them and says, I who have everything, my freedom, authority, a world, a life, a wife, a family, outside of the cell, I have everything, but I don't have what you have. You're sitting praying for a better job, a better house, a better currency, a better environment, a better city, a better car, a better this, because if I have what they have, I'll be happy. But I'm telling you, when you possess the peace of God, they can have everything you don't have be chained to you, see you living your life in such victory every single day that they say, I'll give all this up just to have what you have. Believer, listen to me, you can live your life in such a supernatural power right now. Do you know it would cost the prison guard? What would happen to the prison guard that came to faith in Jesus? What would happen to the prison guard that came to faith in Paul's Christ? They would face the same persecution. How great was Paul's peace that a prison guard would witness the persecution he was placed under and say, I will go through what he goes through that I witness every day so that I could have the God that he has. That the world would see you functioning in the same environment they're in and even recognizing how you might be persecuted for standing in faith. Oh, you don't believe what the world says about things right now. Oh, you don't agree with what the world says is truth right now. Oh, well, now I'll tell you what, you're gonna have to look for a new job because you believe what the Bible says. You're gonna have to look for a new school because you believe what the Bible says. You're gonna have to have security guards around your church because you believe what the Bible says. Well, I'll tell you something, they will see you be persecuted, be pushed down, be oppressed, be challenged, but they will see you possess a peace that they would not only just shift from saying, leave the Christians alone, to saying, if that's what a Christian gets by knowing Jesus, it's worth it for me. This is not a peace like I'm a nice person. This is a peace that says I possess the power of God. I possess the revelation that God is with me right now. I don't need you to tell me I'm free even though I'm in a prison cell and I'm chained to you. I'm freer than you could ever be because I'm free irrespective of circumstance. I'm free irrespective of possession. I'm free, I'm valued irrespective of place and given a role and given a promotion. I'm as valuable as I could ever be. I could be earning the least in the company but have the greatest peace and provision and be so grateful for God in my life that the CEO who is contemplating suicide can't get on with their wife, their husband, is, looks at me and says, what do you have? Because I can buy everything but I can't buy what you have. Paul went through more than anything you and I could ever go through. And he's telling us what the answer is. There's three things he deals with. Anxiety, right? He deals with lack. He deals with stress. And he deals with it the most interesting way. He says, be anxious for nothing. Pray about everything. Thank God for anything. Can I say that again? Be anxious for nothing, pray about everything, thank God for anything. You came in here today with a list of problems, but you couldn't see one thing that was on your side. When we say thank God, you know what you think about? Thanking God for the one thing you don't have rather than thanking God for anything you do have. Pastor, I have nothing. Oh, no, 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 you're alive. 
Pastor, I have nothing. Oh, no, no. You have time. You have the word. You have his grace. You have his power. Paul, sitting there, could have said, I have nothing. But I can imagine him. Thank you, Lord, for this new God. I'm gonna train a new pastor. I'm training a new believer, right? I can't leave this prison to preach, but they will, right? I, I'm just guessing, but you know, often Paul would write letters. How did they get out? I could imagine they're getting written, they're getting passed through the God that goes, tell me the next revelation for the next church. I'll be the one to take it, right? After this shift, I just will disappear and go, right? They became his partners in crime, <laughs> Right? And this is the thing, Paul learns, because what does he say? He says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. The power of thanksgiving in a circumstance where it looks like you have nothing. Jesus is standing in front of a crowd in John chapter six. There's believed to be at least 15 to 20,000 people. We know there was 5,000 men, but that's not women and children. And they tell him that, Jesus, we're out in the middle of nowhere on the top of a mountaintop, right? And I've been there. There's no shops anywhere near there. It's like being on the top of Table Mountain. It feels that way, overlooking Galilee, the region. And the most amazing thing is he's sitting there teaching the word and the disciples come and say, listen, we've been here all day. It's hot. People are gonna be hungry. People need to eat. And then they say to him, let's get food. And he says, great, go get food. And they come back going, <clears throat> uh, to get food for these people, Jesus, um, it's gonna literally be close to half a year's wages and a logistical nightmare. How do we get enough food for 20,000 people to the top of Table Mountain, right? To the top of this hill. There's no roads, there's no, there's no Uber Eats, there's no Mr. Delivery. What are we gonna do? We have nothing, right? You might look at your life today and say, I have nothing. I doubt. I'm telling you, you have something. Stop calling something nothing, right? It says here in John chapter six, verse five through 11, then Jesus lifted up his eyes. He saw a great multitude coming to him. Philip says, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, summons Peter's brother, came to him and said, there is a lad who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? In other words, there's something but there's nothing. Then Jesus says, make the people sit down. Now, why would they sit down? Because he's about to feed them. He seats you at his table in the presence of your enemies, right? Sit down. Oh, Jesus, is a bad idea. They're gonna expect food now. Now there was much grass in the place. Where does he put us? He rests us in his meadows, in his grass, near still waters. That's our good shepherd. Sit down on the grass, relax. So the men sit down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, two loaves, small fish. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. What does Jesus do with little? He gives thanks. He says, God, this is yours. I bless it. Let it multiply. He literally gives thanks by raising his hands. That's how it's giving thanks. Practically speaking, you know that when Abraham gave his tithes to Melchizedek, he says to the devil, I raise my hand with my tithe in worship. That it will never be said you made Abraham rich. Right? The, the, the point is, right? It, it's not about how much you raise. It's that you take the tithe of what you have and you raise it and you give thanks. Now, no one gives thanks when they're getting robbed. If you get robbed, you're not saying thank you. Thank you so much, right? You're not thankful, you're remorseful, you're angry, you've been a victim. Giving thanks is in lieu of what God will do. 
Giving thanks is I recognize you will multiply this to feed your people. You will resource the need that needs to be met. And when God resources a need, not only do all 20,000 people eat, there's food left over. And we don't have time for that illustration because it's a whole picture of the work of Jesus. But the point is, God is not limited in substance, nor supply. But we are limited in giving thanks. We can limit him by going, I refuse to let you be Lord in my life. I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about life. Give thanks for what you have. Be grateful for what you have. See what God has given you. And when you give thanks, what you do is you shift it from in your hands to his hands, right? You give thanks. Now look at this. In the Bible, later in John chapter six, verse 23, it tells us that people came from all over the region because of this great miracle. However, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place. So the, the place was not known as the place where Jesus made bread and fish multiply to feed 20,000 people. The Bible does not call it the place of multiplication. Multiplication was the fruit, but the Bible calls it after its root. The place where they ate bread because the Lord first gave thanks. Let me tell you something. When you take a moment to give thanks, you will look down the road in the future back on all the supply and the miracles that God performed and you will not say, I am where I am because of my multiplication. You will say, I am where I am today because of that moment where I gave thanks to God, where I gave it to Him. Pastor, pastor, you don't understand what I'm going through. I don't, but nothing you go through compares to that which the early church went through. And what do we see? Supply. What do we see? Favor. What do we see? Divine provision. Because that's what Jesus does. And we don't have a church without Jesus. In fact, our church is where Jesus is. It's his work, it's his bride. It's his ministry. This is the sign of him being alive in our life. And I believe next year, many of you are gonna walk in supernatural divine provision, not because of what you did and do then, but because you will look back and say, there was a moment in 2023 when I decided 2024, I am going to give thanks and treat my financial provision as his responsibility. And you will call it the moment where you gave thanks. Yes, the bread was multiplied, but it's because you first gave. The Bible highlights, he first gave thanks. They ate after he gave thanks, right? Well, is this just about money? Not at all. In John chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Four days dead, because in Jewish understanding, the spirit leaves the body on the third day, which is why Jesus was raised again on the third day, because he had to follow pattern that it was the same spirit, okay? But the fourth day is dead, 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 dead. The spirit's gone. Only God can call the spirit back, right? And he shows up. And in the circumstance, everybody's angry, everybody's annoyed, and everybody's pretty frustrated because they're going, if only you had. If only you had. Is that a spirit of thanksgiving? Not at all. That's a spirit of complaining. You know, God, it could have worked if only. It would have worked if only. If you just came when he was sick, we sent you, we sent you. How many times in our lives have we go, God, I had the plan, I had a perfect plan, and that plan even involved you. I called for you when they were sick. If you came when they were sick, you still would have gotten the glory that they got healed. But you didn't fall in line with my plan. My life would have worked if only, my career would have worked if only, my calling, oh God, I know you have a great calling on my life, but then you put me in a church like this with people like them to serve this one who offends me and that one who doesn't recognize me. And you know what? I could have been used by God. I could have joined the dream team, but my first dream team night, I met this, this person, that person. You know what? The one person in the church I refuse to forgive, that's the person now you put me with. 
If only we had gone with my plan. Right? Look at this. Jesus says to her, did I not say to you that if you'd only believe, you would see the glory of God? Meaning you're talking about your words, your circumstance, your revelation, but I've already said to you, you'll see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone where the dead man was lying. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. One of the shortest prayers in scripture recorded, if not the shortest prayer in scripture recorded, is thanks. Jesus didn't go, God, God, I'm now coming to you. This is a serious matter this time. Are we gonna, everyone stop. I've got to fast the whole day. I've got to pray the whole night because this, he's dead four days. I never thought this was gonna happen. I didn't know what to do with this. You're right, if only I came a bit earlier. I mean, this is a big prayer. No one has been raised from the dead ever in history and ever again dead four days. Not possible. You know what I'm trying to say? He could have said, we've got to put in a mega prayer here with mega faith. It's gonna take huge faith to raise Lazarus from the dead. And by that, he could have meant, or we would have meant, it's gonna take a lot of religious activity here. Long prayers, lots of giving, lots of fasting. Shortest prayer in scripture was not, look at the circumstance. It was, thank you, that you're greater than the circumstance. That was it. And it was through covenant relationship as a child of God. Father, one name Jesus came to teach us about God, the name that was never mentioned until Jesus was on earth, the name that was never revealed about God until Jesus said, let me teach you how to pray. Abba, Father. We knew God in many other names until Jesus came because when he came, he put us in covenant relationship as God's child. And now you get to pray, Dad. This is the prayer, Dad. Thanks. Amen. Thanks, Dad. Was Lazarus still dead? Yes. <laughs> the greatest faith. Can I tell you something? I wanna challenge you on this last thought. Pray prayers with big faith. Do you know what big faith is? Shift from please to thanks. Thanks. Please God, please provide. Please God, please deliver. Please God, thank you God, you're providing. Thank you God, you've already delivered me. Thank you God, even though I don't see it, it's been done. There's a lot to complain about. Oh, there's a lot to worry about. But can I tell you something? That's not your problem. It's not your problem, it's his. Your challenge is stay at peace. How do you stay at peace? Don't worry about being at peace. Take the actions, which is be anxious for nothing, pray about everything, and give thanks about anything. When it says pray about everything, it doesn't mean pray about everything, it means be spiritually conscious about everything. Right? So pray about everything is not pray about everything. It's about when you get a natural thought, submit it to the word of God. I'm finished. What is praying about? I'm finished, the thought mean. Lord, I'm not finished. For you know the plans you have for me, the purpose you have for me, the future you have for me. See, it's not praying about everything. It's about bringing everything to submission to his word. Right? And then what? God, because you've already dealt with it, I don't need to please, 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 please. I get to say thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you, God, that 2024 is full of supply. 2024 is full of health. 2024 is full of protection. And God doesn't need to take you out of the prison to take the prison out of you. 
right in the midst of every circumstance, every trial and every tribulation, you get to walk with supernatural peace, supernatural power, supernatural supply. So much so that those around you will see it and go, that's the God I want. I don't want my God to be money anymore. I don't want my God to be power anymore. I don't want my God to be fame or success or celebrity. No, my God doesn't need to be materialistic things. My God needs to be your God because your God gives you what I could never buy, what I could never take, what I could never earn. That's what it is to walk with Him. I believe this next season is not about being overcome by worry, but overcoming worry. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us today and we trust that you were blessed. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our page and maybe share this word with someone else. Or even better, join us in person at one of our churches yes. one day. Until then, be blessed.